So here we talk about singular and simplex or singular homology. Uh, this you can find on page 108 of Hatcher. So the most important point here is we discussed in uh, simplical homology before we were using simplical complexes as the basis. So here instead of simplical complexes we will be using maps, continuous maps acting on these complexes. So yeah so for example say in C1 there are suppose five one simplices lying. So instead of five one simplices, now we have these continuous maps acting on them. So those five one simplices in C1 would have acted as a basis of C1. Now we will have these maps acting as basis of C1. So that is the important distinction. So instead of having simplical complexes, you just have these maps sigma. Now another important point is these maps are continuous. So what they are going to do, they're basically, so there are some components. So I said five points or five parts in C1, one simplicity. So this map sigma will act continuously on it and, to, and will take it as uh, those particular components in C0. So, uh, so we need to talk about the boundary of the map the boundary is precisely uh, what it is in simplical complexes just that instead of simplical complex we write sigma acting on that simplical complex so why is it called singular if this is because uh, this continuous map sigma may not have a nice embedding but it can have singularities okay so whatever we have said uh, we are going to use this in this proposition. So you take a space X and decompose it into its path connected components say X alpha and then there is an isomorphism homology groups of the space is direct sum of the homology groups of these path connected components. Now this is pretty clear in the simplical complex case because there we just have the chain complex which is formed by these simplical complexes as the basis. So you obviously have it broken down as direct sum. You have seen that in multiple examples which we computed before uh, this lecture began that how there were three edges you took Z3 as the basis, the two edges you took Z2 as the basis. And so is true for when there is a action of a continuous map. So what we are saying is in essence nothing has changed how you will compute it. So what is the proof? Proof is simply that what happened in simplical homology also happens in singular homology because the map sigma is continuous. So what is the important implication of this? So these maps take path connected components to path connected components. That is from when you go from CN plus 1 to CN, you take something which is path connected to path connected. That is nothing but the property of a continuous map. So again, what is happening is your CN is decomposed as path connected components. Just like in simplical homology. So this is the boundary map. So this boundary map has to have two important properties. First, it should preserve direct sum. And second, kernel of this map and image of this map split as direct sums. Again, this follows from the property of sigma being continuous. Now because there is a split, so chain complexes behave precisely in the way they behave in simplical complexes, so the homology groups also split because if kernel and image are splitting, so the homology groups are splitting. 
that is kind of the essence of computing homology. Now in this lecture I want to talk about reduced homology and to talk about reduced homology we have to first talk about homology of a path connected component. So if x is a non-empty and path connected then the zeroth homology group of the space is nothing but ring of integers. Yeah, thus for any space X, the zeroth homology group is nothing but direct sum of these integers, one for each path connected component. So let us write the proof of the proposition above. So you know that the second part just follows from the previous proposition. So for the proof, we know that x0, x is always c0 over image of delta 1. As we have seen in examples, that is because everything in c0 is the kernel of delta 0. So this is what we have to prove. So this first step is obviously to construct a map from C0 to integers. And then show that kernel of this map is image of delta 1 and this map is on to. So, as you know, this C0 is nothing but uh, it's a free group on uh, the singular complexes acting on points. So, you take the sum of the coefficients and this map is surjective. Uh, you can see, you know, take any integer and you can form a free group of sigma i, no matter how you, you can take the sum, yeah. So, say it's 5, then you add, take 2, 3, 2, 3, sigma 0 and uh, you are done. So if kernel of this map is image of delta 1, we are done, yeah, because, yeah, this, there's absolutely nothing to say here, but I will just make it clear by writing image of delta 1 here. Now you see this looks precisely like the zeroth homology group there at the start of the proof which I have written. Okay, so two things we have to do. So we have to show that kernel of E is image of delta 1. So we have to show first that image of delta 1 lies in the kernel. And the second thing we have to show that kernel of E lies in image of delta 1. So as a standard proof in algebra, we will take an element of the boundary map delta 1, apply E to it and show that this is 0. So that will show that element of delta 1 lies in the kernel. So we have to show this is 0. So what is the boundary? We just apply the boundary map. So what you have done is you have taken an edge. See we are in C1 now because image of delta 1 acts on C1. C1 consists of edges. There is an edge from V1 to V2 and you have applied the boundary map to it. So you just think of V1 minus V2 and then you apply sigma to it. Now why it is 1 minus 1? Because the coefficient of both of this, this is coefficient n is 1. So 1 minus 1 is 0. So first part is done. Second part. This is slightly more involved. So again, you start with an element of the kernel. So if you're starting with the element of kernel means you have, you apply E to the map it should give you 0. Now here the important point to note is how we have defined the map E.
yeah so since it is a kernel sigma ni has to go to 0 yeah, this is clear from the definition and second thing you should note is that these sigma i's are nothing but zero simplices which are points of x or part of c0x now obviously e is the map which acts on c0 and c0 consists of points so uh, sigma i are nothing but zero simplices so you have to consider sigma i as these points but although sigma i is a map acting on these points uh, you get the you get uh, the idea which i'm trying to convey So the second part is that you fix a point x0 of the space. This point x0 is nothing but x0 or x0 is nothing but the image of say uh, sigma0, the map sigma0. Yeah. So you fix the point x0 and then you draw a path, this path tau i from this point x0 which is nothing but sigma0, you draw a path from sigma 0 to sigma i. So why are we drawing this path? We are trying to show that this map is nothing but kernel of E that comes from the paths in C1. So if it comes from the paths then it lies in the image of delta 1. So boundary of this is nothing but sigma i minus sigma 0. So that is very clear. So what is the boundary of all these paths. So why are we doing this? Because we are saying that the image of these paths, what is the image of these paths? So the image of these paths is nothing but uh, here. Here you see the second term sigma 0 is a constant, but sigma ni sums to 0, so this second term becomes 0. And what we get is just sigma i and i sigma i and now you see it closely and you see that if we started with the element of the kernel such that the sum of coefficients for zero what we get is something which is a boundary of the paths so you take an element in the kernel which is the sum of its coefficients is zero and you find out that actually they arose from the paths in C1. So you are taking elements of C0 which have arisen in C1. So you have to take points So and you say these points come from the paths. That is the entire thing. Image of delta 1. 